We're going to get into today's message, and I'm going to pull this up and just have like this fireside chat with you today. We've been doing this series called Breaking the Rules, and what we've been talking about in this series is breaking the rules of the norm. How many of you know that things can become normal, that maybe they shouldn't be normal, right? That can happen. And I think in our culture today, some of the things uh, like this church at Corinth that we've talked about through this series, we've talked about family the first week, the second week, we talked about Baal worship. And nobody here would say, well, I'm a Baal worshiper until we discover what Baal worship is. And then we would probably say, yeah, we probably all of us struggle with that temptation. And, and, and then we're going to talk about a topic today that is, uh, um, well, it's common to all of us. You, uh, you are very familiar with this topic. Now, I'm going to talk to you not from the posture of a religious leader bringing you the religious truth. I'm going to talk to you as a pastor who loves you, who has an accountability before God. Someday I'll stand before him. My prayer is that I hear from him, well done, Darren. You were a faithful servant. My prayer is that I don't hear him say, what a wuss you were. You would cyst out on everything. You were so scared. No, 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 I'm not going to hear that. So I'm going to talk about what might be an uncomfortable topic. And in advance, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. I'm going to bring some stuff up today that for some of us may be painful for a minute. But stick with me mentally and emotionally because what I have for you today is going to bring you such hope, such encouragement. I'm going to bring healing to you in such a way today. But first, it's going to get uncomfortable for just a minute. The church at Corinth, and the reason that we're doing this series is because the church at Corinth is much like the American church today. The church in Corinth was in Greece. They were very prosperous, very affluent. By the way, Americans, we live in the top 1% to 2% of wealth in the world. So if you're an American, you hit the lottery. Now, you may be here and may feel like, well, I got bills unpaid. I've got bill collectors calling, and uh, I've got some unanswered things that I have. I I want you to know I understand that, but just the fact that you're in these United States of America, you have an opportunity to come up and out, and pretty quick, too, if you just make some wise choices and some right decisions. So I told you, I'm not bringing today's message to you from the posture or the point of, I've got the answers and you need to listen to me. My heart breaks today because so many people that I've, Pastor Lauren, I've ministered to over the years, we have been pastors. We've dealt with a lot of situations that are rooted back to the topic that we're going to talk about today. See, the enemy wants to bring a lie to create a new normal. And that lie is for us. It's not really a lie to us. We're not really deceived from the lie uh, until a lie is not powerful until you're deceived, right? A lie can come. You've been lied to before, and you know you were being lied to, right? Those lies aren't scary. The scary lies are the lies that come, and you're unaware that they are a lie, and you buy into them, and deception comes. And when you're deceived, you act out on the lie that you heard. See, everything comes back to this temptation. The temptation that that Jesus experienced after his 40-day fast. We talked a little bit about it through this series as we talked about family and we talked about Baal and we talked about the different topics of holiness. It all comes back to worship. And went all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the whole sin issue that happened was a result of what happened over the issue of worship. What is worship? Well, we have the tendency, don't we, to think that it's singing. We're going to sing and we're going to lift our hands. And though that is an expression of worship, it's not true worship because true worship is a lifestyle of decision and choices that come from a thought process in the heart. And so as you remember, Adam and Eve, they goofed up in this area because they were, they were deceived and they thought they could be like God and they bought into the lie. Well, as you move forward through the scripture, 
God calls certain things holy. That tree, that one tree they couldn't eat from was called holy. The rest of the trees were not off limits to them. They could eat all they wanted from it. As it comes to money, you know, the tithe has always been from the beginning. People say, people make an excuse for the tithe. They say, well, I, I don't want to uh, tithe because that was in the law. And so, well, that's a good excuse to not have to tithe, right? I'm looking for any reason here. But the tithe was before the law. The tithe was during the law. The tithe is after the law. What is the tithe? Well, the tithe is 10% of our income, and God calls it holy. But here's the good news about any holy thing that we are tempted to touch or to take, the temptation to do it. The good news is when we honor and we come up under and worship is a point of reverence of saying, okay, you're God, I'm not. When you come up under that thing and you honor that thing and reserve it as something holy, the rest of it gets blessed. So everything else in the garden would have been blessed if they would have not touched the holy thing, eaten the holy thing. When it comes to the tithe in our lives, the 90% does way more than the 100% could have done. I'm not trying to get your money, so don't be nervous. I'm just teaching you the biblical principles of holy things. And then the third holy thing that we're going to talk about today is sex. Dun, dun, dun. Are you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Let's talk about sex, because sex is the place you ought to talk about it is in church. Now, when I grew up in church, I remember sex being a taboo topic to talk about. We didn't talk about it in church. In fact, we kind of had this idea, maybe you still may have a little bit of this mentality that has crept into your mentality, that, that God is surprised with it. I mean, like, he's like, oh, my eye self. What are they doing? You can laugh with me, guys. Come on. Don't look, look looking all serious. Y'all got here because of sex. Y'all here in this auditorium because of sex. We're going to talk. This side's cheering me a little bit more. Sorry, I'm going to go over here and talk to you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the point. I want to remind you once again, I am not bringing this message to you to be religiously correct. I am bringing this message to you to bring love to you, healing to you, hope to you, encouragement to you, and a better day for you tomorrow, health for today, to help restore maybe some of the mistakes that were made of the past, and to take you into a future that God has for you. The lie has always been that the enemy says, well, this is what's normal, which is always because the, when, the, when the enemy speaks, he speaks his native language. He is a liar. Are you with me? And um, he is a liar. So if he speaks, he speaks his native language. He lies quite a bit. I'm getting quite a bit of feedback up here. I don't know if you guys are getting it out there, but I've got a big hum. All right. So... What I want to share with you is I want to share with you hope today to expose the truth, to turn the lights on in this area so that we can be free. Once again, my wife and I, through the years, we've been pastoring for many, many years. And even before we were senior pastors, we pastored the church from a uh, assistant point of view. And, uh, and, and, and most, I would say most of the topics of issues that we've dealt with with people came from this area of sexuality. Pornography, big one, huge one, pornography. Another one, promiscuity, sex outside of marriage. Um, uh, a, a third one was, and this is a big one, is sexual abuse and rape. And a lot of the issues that we deal with are, are, are addictions and depressions and abuse with substances and abuse with alcohol. A lot of these things came from abuses of this area. So the cultural norm and the lie has been, in fact, if you watch TV, like the average American watches TV, if you've done it for a year and you've watched TV for a year, uh, you have probably witnessed the average, the average, so it's much higher than this, but if you've watched the average TV, you have witnessed, not including movies, just TV, you have witnessed 17,000 sex scenes on television. Now, 
of those 17,000, 91% of the 17,000 statistically are shown to be sex scenes outside of marriage. Why is that important? Because God has a way, and he calls the marriage bed holy. The sex in the marriage bed is called holy for a reason. He made that for you to not violate that. I've got some good news for you today, so stick with me. I know we're talking about an uncomfortable topic, and it's probably uncomfortable for my kids to hear me preach (laughs) this topic to you today, but I just want to share with you there's help and healing, and I'm being a daddy to you today. These are the tough talks that we should have with our children because the lie is, here's the first lie. The first lie is everybody's doing it. As if that makes it okay because everybody's doing it. You've heard the old phrase, if everybody jumps off of the cliff, are you going to jump off of the cliff too? You've heard that probably before. Well, the lie of culture. In fact, I had a young man come to me a year ago, and he says to me, he says, hey, look, everybody, because he was having sex outside of marriage, he's going, everybody's doing this. God has had to change his attitude about it. Everybody's doing it. And he said, so it's not that big of a deal to him because he's, had, he's been forced to have to deal with it as a normal. And I thought that's exactly what a lie is, brought into the deception of the enemy that just because it has become a new norm, See, if I was the enemy and I was going to deceive culture and let it creep into the church to to hurt church people who are serving God, who are worshiping God, I'd bring about that lie too because everybody's doing it. It makes it normal. That's the first lie. The second lie is that, hey, it's just an isolated event. I mean, what's the big deal? It's one time, one and done, one and out, or that it's recreational in that way. It is recreational for marriage. Did you know God put the pleasure in sex? It's not like he just said, well, I'm going to invent this thing so they can make more babies. No, he's a good God, everybody. He put some pleasure in there for you to enjoy. It's not only for procreation. I like it when I get amens. I usually have to beg for them, but y'all are giving them to me today freely. Thank you. It's not only for procreation. It's also, it's a bond, a spiritual bond. It's a glue to the marriage. It's a glue to the marital relationship that holds it together, and it is very pleasurable. The lie of the enemy is that everybody's doing it outside of marriage, so it's okay, it won't hurt anything. The lie of the enemy that It's an isolated event. It'll be over, and there's no repercussions. Let me say, there are massive repercussions. Guilt, shame, uh, uh, the list goes on and on. And let me say this again to you. This is not, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. So all of us are probably common in this thing. Wisdom comes by two ways. Wisdom comes by number one, the school of hard knocks, which has been for most of us. That's what we've done. Like, boom. Oh, that hurt. Don't want to do that again. But I did it again. I can't believe it. And then we get wise. But the best wisdom, the very best wisdom that comes to us is the wisdom that comes from watching, first of all, what God's word says. I, I trust him. He, he knows. He's the designer. He's the creator. He's the builder. He invented sex. And he invented us, so he must know what he's doing. And learning from what other people have gone through. The lie of the evil one is this is a big, huge one. Is that sex outside of marriage is okay if, and here's the big one, and I've, the painful thing is I've even heard Christian people use this that sex outside of marriage is okay as long as you're in love. I mean, if you love one another, it's going to be okay. I mean, if you've got plans and you're engaged and someday we're going to get married, it's okay. Once again, this is not a religious, it's not me trying to force religion down your throat. I'm pastor daddy today. 
And I'm going to have, I'm going to bring some things to you that is going to set you free, that's going to bring healing to your life, and it's going to help your sex life down the road get better. Being pastors, we've time and time again had congregation members and attenders come to us. And I'll never forget, well, there's no consequences. There are. Well, this is just, you know, it's like spring break. We, you know, we're wild. You got to get the wild stuff out while you're young. We had a young girl come to us after a service, and it breaks my heart to even tell this story, but this was several years ago, and this young girl came up after the service to my wife and I and, and said, and tears were flowing down her face, and she said, there's this guy, see, there's this guy that I liked for a long time. I've been attracted to him for so long, and circumstances put me in a situation where well, I gave myself to him. It was a one-time event, and I gave myself to him. And I'm so overwhelmed with shame, and I'm so overwhelmed with guilt. And then she just burst. And she said, Pastors, please pray for me because I don't even want to live anymore. And I said, What's wrong? And she said, It was one time. She just kept saying it was one time. I thought she was going to tell me she was pregnant. And as the tears began to flow, she said, he gave me an STD, sexually transmitted disease, that the doctors tell me I'm going to have it the rest of my life. And here's my pain. And she was weeping. My pain, Pastor, is that someday when I meet, she was a good Christian girl. And she said, I, I, I gave myself and I've ruined myself. And she said, someday when I meet the guy that I am going to marry, that I'm going to give my life to, I'm done with that guy. I'm going to have to have this conversation with him. And her heart was broken. Now, that story could be repeated, I kid you not, a thousand times with different consequences. Depression, thoughts of suicide because of the guilt, because of the shame. Why? Because... What's wrong with people, right? No. I'm going to tell you why. It's because sex is holy. It was created for marriage, and there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. But watch this. When we violate God's knowledge of what's best, whether it's with our money, I promise you, the tithe is the tithe is the tithe. And if you jack with the tithe, you're touching what's holy. You're going to pay when you play. And when you play sexually with something holy, see what mammon does, the spirit of mammon, is when we, the lie, the deception is that we actually end up worshiping. We think worship is just singing and, and raising our hands. Worship is really when you yield yourself to a lie about worship and, and something that is holy. And we did that with Baal last week as we talked about who's in control of my life when we think that we call the shots and when we think that I've got to step in and I've got to answer everything and it doesn't look like God's doing anything and we step in, what are we doing? We're playing all powerful and we're worshiping that which is holy, which is the actual worship of our life. That's Baal, who was powerful. You probably remember the story of Elijah and the whole thing on Baal was over the power power. Who's in power? Is it us or is it God? And if you remember the story, I don't have time to teach it today, but it is God that is in power. When we acknowledge that, we yield to him. When we tithe, every time we tithe, we say, look, you gave me the ability to work. You gave me the ability to think. You gave me the ability with these hands to do something. And by bringing that which is holy, it's not even mine to give to you. I, don't, I can't give you what's not mine. And our sex life is to be enjoyed within the context and the confines of marriage. The reason pornography is bad is because we're taking our imagination, and your imagination is the po most powerful thing you have. Yes. You're taking it outside of the marriage, and you're using your imagination in an inappropriate way. So our mind gets polluted from the pornography. It's quiet in here. And I, once again, 
I want to say it three or four more times, probably through the message. This is not about being religiously right. This is about your pastor daddy saying, hey, God's got a great future for you. God's got good things for you. And if we'll simply yield to his holiness in this area, you can have all the sex you want in the context of marriage. Amen. So here, here's some of the things that society has made normal. That, hey, wait a minute, your sex drive, you can't help that. Kind of compare it with animal, animal drive, right? In fact, when we go to teach our children about it, we use terminology of animals. I want to talk to you about the birds and the bees, everybody. <laughs> the birds and the bees. We talk about that. And it's as if you, you can't control yourself. How many of you are hunters? Any hunters in the room? I know it's not politically correct to talk about it, so most people keep it down, but <laughs> let me just tell you. Hunters take advantage of the animalistic drive of animals. For example, deer season is coming up in a couple of months. Now, here's what happens. If you've ever been deer hunting, you go station yourself usually in a camouflage area up in the tree or in a tent somewhere, and you wait. You may spray some stuff out in the air, but you hide your scent and you wait. Now, a little, a little fawn may come out in the field, and you don't want that anyway because that's just a baby little, little deer, and uh, a doe might come out, and if you're desperate, you'll get your doe, but the big prize is the buck. I have an eight-point Buck, eight points, means the antlers are eight, eight at four on that side, four on that side. But you want one more than that. You want a 10 point. You want a 12 point. You want a big old buck. The more the points means that, that they're wise and probably old. They've been wise enough to avoid the hunters. And what they do is, uh, if you're lucky and you're deer hunting, the buck will come out to the edge of the field with his head up. And he looks, he stops at the edge, doesn't he, Charles? Yeah, he, he just like pull up, look around. Mm, I don't know if I want to go out there and he'll. But then there's this season called the rut. The rut is the season of mating. It's when the doe goes into heat and puts the smell of deer sex in the air. I'm going to just be real with you. All of the sudden, that smart buck loses his mind. His normal thinking goes out the window. Where's she at? Where's she at? And he'll, now he's not at the edge of the field. Now he's like on the field. He's like, where's she at? Where's she at? Mm. Boom! He's hanging on your wall. <laughs> now, let me just say, yes, when we reduce our sex drive to an animalistic thing, let me just tell you, the Bible shares this with us, everybody, that the enemy goes about as a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. What does it look like being devoured by this sex drive? It looks like an addiction. I'll tell you what else it looks like. Major shame and major guilt, which leads to depression, discouragement. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just depressed. I'm just discouraged. Maybe I should go to the doctor. Now I get on medication. Well, that wasn't quite enough either. Let me drink some alcohol with my medication. The next thing, this thing leads down a slippery slope of pain. Think about the turkey. If any of you have ever been turkey hunting, what turkey hunters do is they've got this little thing that makes the female... Uh, bird noise, you scratch it, and it goes, rrr, 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 rrr. scratch it again, rrr. that's the girl, and then the guy, he answers back, <laughs> 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 
He fluffs up real big and you get him. Boom. See, the, if we reduce this thing, and we've even done it with dogs. I mean, we talk about sex a lot. Like we use the dog term for the sex drive and we use the dog term for sex positions. And, and by the way, let me just say this. In the context and the confines of marriage, the Bible says that sex is, is good. God invented it. He invented the pleasure of it. Pastor, what positions are okay? <laughs> all of them, baby. All of them are good. <laughs> Experiment if you're married. Try this, try that, do this, do that. All, are you glad you came to church today? Uh, I just want to remove the guilt from you. If, you're, if you've got a skewed... Watch this, because I want to bring some healing. I cannot tell you how many times you think there's no consequences to it, but once you're married, we've counseled with couples through the years who either he or she had been raped or been very promiscuous when they were young or been exposed to a lot of sexual behavior activity at a very early age. And during the dating relationship, the common thing we hear is, man, I don't know what happened. When we dated, we were like rabbits. We had sex all the time when we were dating. But then, then all of a sudden, we got married, and it was like, he or she, we, I've heard it both ways. The idea about sex changed, and he won't give me some, or he, she won't give me some, and I have to beg, and she's not interested anymore, or he's not interested anymore. And then, inevitably, he goes to pornography, or he goes and gets attention from someone who's given him attention, and all of a sudden an affair happened. And he didn't mean to, or she didn't mean to, and they're now coming to the pastors. And once again, this is not about condemning anybody or pointing the finger at anybody. But it's about getting a heart and a, most of all a mind right so that a heart can get right in this area. And I'm bringing some stuff to you, and you may be sitting here going, I, I should have stayed home today. <laughs> You being here is no accident because this stuff will set you free. There's nothing like having a guilt-free, peaceful, marital, healthy, physical, intimate relationship with your spouse. It is incredible. It's holy. It's godly. In fact, the scripture says, be intoxicated with the wife of your youth. Now, that word intoxicated means to be beside yourself. Woohoo! I would have put that in your notes if I could have explained that, but how do you do that, right? Intoxicated with your spouse. If we get our thinking right, Romans chapter 12. Don't do it the way the world does it. Instead, instead, renew your mind to God's ways. Then you'll know the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God for your life. If we think wrong about it. So, another story. A young, beautiful, late teenage girl came to us a year ago. And she said, I'm confused about something, and I want to get your opinion. I'm friends with another Christian woman who's a little bit older than me. And I, I told her I want to meet a guy, the right guy. And I don't know who that is yet, but I'm getting that anxiousness that I want to meet the right guy. You know what I mean? And we said, yeah, we know what you mean. And she said, well, I was talking to this other Christian woman, and she told me, she was older than her, she told me, what I need to do is I need to go out and lose my virginity to some guy, some random guy, whatever. She said, just go out and find a guy, give yourself to him, lose your virginity, get your heart broke, 
and get initiated into life. We've all had it happen. And I said, what's this lady's name? And the reason I ask that question is because if you've been on my side of it, and you've stood by the bed of a young man or a young woman who has overdosed and tried to take their own life on not one, but two, three, four different times, all stemming back to sexual behavior or sexual addiction and the guilt and the shame that the devil puts on you. See, the devil is a liar. And he'll look at you and he'll say, what's it hurt? It's one time. Look at the website. What's it hurt? It's just sex and God made it and it's good. Or he'll lie and say, well, you do love him or you do love her, don't you? And yeah, go ahead. But I wanted to find out who this lady's name was so that I could go back and have a discussion with her. And when I did find out who it was, I instantly had a great response for the young lady. I said, oh, 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 no, no, no. She told you completely wrong. In fact, I'm not trying to out her to you, but I know her personally, and she has had three suicide attempts. Yes, she has. I know her. She personally is addicted to a lot of medication. The only thing I can understand is probably misery loves company, and it does love company. And the lie that she has bought into, by the way, she was very promiscuous, and I love her to pieces. And there's healing and hope available to her. But the lie that she's bought into, that it's not a big deal, and somehow she hasn't connected the dots, that this behavior has caused this behavior. And for her to tell you that, let me just protect you. Let me build a wall around you and protect you and save you for yourself, for your future husband, and tell you that I love you. And I began to pray for her. My wife brought her into this soul situation and We just had to really just say, no, that is bad, bad, bad advice. Don't listen to that. You know what that is? That's exactly what Paul was dealing with in the church in Corinth. He wasn't mad at the church in Corinth. He wasn't mad at the people. He had all these people who, you know, they worshiped Asherah before they were Christians. And that mindset of worshiping Asherah, what Asherah was, in fact, here's what their practice was in that day. They had Asherah poles in the temple. Now, an Asherah pole is what you have at the strip clubs. It's a pole that you perform dances with. And they would actually have in that day temple prostitution. Can you imagine that? That the cultural norm was let's go to church to worship Asherah, the little G, not God, God, but the little G, come to church, have sex with the temple prostitute, go home and have uh, chicken for dinner. That's the church that had come to Jesus, and they had a lot of mind renewing to do. And Paul, being a good apostle, working with them, helping them renew their mind to the truth of God's word. It's not okay. It'll destroy you. It will eat you up down the road. Hey, everybody, is this series a tough one? Yeah, because it deals with the true issues The rubber meets the road on this series with our money, with our thought life, and with our pleasure. And I love you enough to tell you the truth about it, not from a, I'm better than you. I have violated every one of these, the money. I've violated the power of who's really God in my life. I have violated this thing sexually in my life. It's a whole nother series we'll do sometime and But I'm not perfect in this area. And you're not perfect in this area. And there is no condemnation for us. Me too. So what do we do? Number one, we repent. Most people think that repentance means you, I'm so sorry, God. God, I'm sorry. 
That's not repentance. The word repent is the word, the Greek word, metanoia. The word metanoia means to go a different direction. It means I've gone this direction. This is the way I used to go. I used to think this way. I used to go this way. Metanoia means turn around and go a different direction. That's metanoia. Repent. Number two, ask for God's forgiveness and receive it. This is, the, this is the best news of today. Isaiah, it's in your notes, says this, that though your sins be as scarlet, though they be as crimson, when you come to Jesus in Christ, he will make all things new and he will make you whiter than snow. In other words, pure. Well, pastor, I've lost my virginity. I've violated this so bad. Here's the good news. In Christ, when you receive forgiveness in him, there is therefore now no condemnation. Your past sin, your present sin, your future sin. It's been forgiven, and you are a new creation in Christ all together. Paul's still talking to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians. He said, you've been made new. All things in you have been made new, all together new. You're not even the same person. And so all of that guilt and all of that shame and all of that yesterday and all of that yesteryear and all of those mistakes, all that guilt and shame, may it be lifted off of you as you receive his forgiveness today. Forgive yourself now. If he has forgiven you, don't insult God by holding that over yourself. You're done with it. You're forgiven. He forgave you. Now you forgive you. And then the last and the third thing is this. Reorder your life. This is the hardest one. This is the hardest one of today. Reorder your life. Man, we've been, <laughs> we've been bad, Pastor. We've been having sex. We, we love each other. It's going to be hard to stop this. I know. But reorder, what does that look like? Well, it means you've got to make some decisions I can give you a little pastoral daddy advice. If you're engaged and you love one another, if you wouldn't marry him or you wouldn't marry her, then break up today. Break up today. That'll help you. That's reordering. No need in fiddle diddling around with a relationship that's not marriage material. All right? If, if they are marriage material and you really do love them, Give yourself some space. Protect and honor this sexuality. Save it for marriage. If you say, Pastor, the temptation is oh so strong, maybe do something like my pastor friend used to do with his youth group. Back when I was a youth pastor, I used to have this pastor friend who was a youth pastor. And he would see a couple. She would start wearing his letterman jacket. She'd have on his class ring. They'd be all cuddled up in service, church together. And he'd call him up front. He'd call him up, man. He'd have, hey, I want John and I want Linda to come up front. I want him to stand right here with me. Now, they're dating right now. They're being test, tested and tempted sexually, no doubt. Not, we're going to call out the elephant in the room, everybody. We're not going to act like it ain't happening. It's happening. They're being tempted. They're being tested of the enemy. We want to pray for them right now. He'd pray for them publicly, and he would do this. He bought, he bought all of these, and he'd buy a hundred of them at a time. They were those big coffee table Bibles. You know the ones I'm talking about? They're like this big. They're white or black, and they sit on the coffee table. Family Bibles, you know what I'm talking about? He would say, you're dating now. You're being tempted now. We want to present this Bible to you. And every time you go on a date, every time you're alone sitting on a couch, every time you're in a car, we want you to set that Bible in between the two of you. It will help you mentally keep your head right. Just set it there. And he said, inevitably, he said, inevitably, I'd get a phone call or they pull me off to the side at church and said, can I talk to you? I've had this question too. How far is too far? What's okay for us to do? Can we kiss? Can we make out? Can we use our hands? Can we 
I mean, like, really, I mean, these are real questions, and the enemy will lie to you. Like, is it okay to do oral? I mean, it's not penetration, so it's probably okay. Our president told us it's all right. What? <laughs> and he'd say, you know what? I'm not the sin police, and I love this. He said, just do this. Put that Bible in between you. And if you would do it over the top of that Bible, that let that kind of be your conscious, okay? And uh, I want to say to you today, reorder your life. Put that Bible in between. Quit making those phone. If it's, if it's something just totally outside of marriage that, you know, you're flirting around with some attention you're getting at work or a situation, go ahead and reorder it's key. It's key. And the last thing is this. Change your mindset. It's not a sacrifice to save yourself. It's not a sacrifice at all. It's an investment. It's an investment when you protect that which is holy, the marriage bed. When you protect it, do you know what you're doing? You're not just like sacrificing like, oh man, we could be having such good sex right now. Oh man, I could be outside. I've never, ever, I've never in all of my life ever being a pastor had anybody come to me and say, you know all that sex I had? I'm so glad I had it. I, I, my only regret is that I wish I would have had more sex outside. I've never heard that. I've only heard the pain of, I wish, I wish I would have protected this area. I've never heard the other. By reordering, and there's really only one way to reorder, and that is by putting Jesus first of your life. <laughs> Remember this. In Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for you that are in Christ. If you can stay in Jesus, let it be Jesus. Let it be him who is in your life. You're probably here today thinking, well, man, I wish so-and-so would have heard this. I wish, here's good news for you. This is going to be on YouTube. Send this link to some people that need to hear it. I'm, I'm delivering it with love. There's no condemnation. There's hope. There's forgiveness. And in Christ, you've got a better tomorrow, a better today, because let healing start today. Let him come into your life. And let today be great. And then when you get married, or those of you that are already married, start fresh today. Let him make you white as snow. Let him remove some of that guilt, some of that shame. And go home this afternoon, if you're married, and enjoy your spouse. Be together. Be healed. Be healed.